So I was reading some stories this week, and I told you last week I love sweet little Christmas stories, and this one I thought was one of the better ones. The six-year-old Sunday school class was asked to reenact the Christmas story. Yet this story, this time, the teacher said, I want you just to, just to do it as you understand it. So I want you to make up your own script. And, and of course, with a bunch of six-year-old kids, it was quite imaginative. There were five Marys, two Josephs, six shepherds, two wise men, and a boy who wanted to be a cow. <laughs> and there was one other. There was one other, one other character because there was this one boy that was determined that the Christmas story had to have a, a doctor to deliver the baby Jesus. <laughs> and so as, the, as they began to act it out because the, the, the teacher was just curious to see how this was gonna play out, she was watching and all of a sudden this little boy who was the doctor walks over, picks up the baby Jesus, wraps him up in a blanket and walks over to all the Marys and the Josephs and says, congratulations, it's a God. <laughs> just love that story. Love that story. You know, this, the truth is this, this little boy got it right. He got what so many adults miss, what so many people miss, and that is the incarnation, that God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And that really is the heart of the Christmas story, that God stepped out of heaven into flesh to become the Savior of the world. God with us to die for us so that we, so that he might live in us. A great, great message. Well, we're three weeks into a four-week series on, I'm going to steal this. Oh, you got me? There you go. Everybody give Rob a hand. <laughs> we're three weeks into a... We're three weeks into a four-week series on the cast of Christmas. We're looking at the who's who of the Christmas story. And so far, we've looked at Mary, and we looked at Joseph, and we looked at the importance of God's call upon their lives and how that's relevant to each of us. Well, today, I want to turn our attention to the story of the shepherds. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to learn, turn to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 8 to 15 in just a minute. Now, before we get there, uh, I need to burst your Christmas bubble. Now, I'm going to do it by giving you really some clarity on the history of Christmas, because Christmas didn't really happen on December the 25th, as most of you are aware. The Roman Catholic Church, many, many years ago, they put it on December the 25th, and they did it for noble reasons, but maybe even some wrong reasons. See, when Constantine legalized Christianity in the 4th century, there were already two competing holidays in Roman life. One was called the Feast of Saturnalia, and the other was called Sol Invictus. And both of them were just after the winter solstice, which is December the 22nd, I think, maybe the 21st. 21st, there you go. I knew it was one of those two days. Anyway, and what they would do, they would come and they would celebrate that once again, light had conquered darkness. Well, when the Roman Empire became Christianized, what they did was they said, we need to do something to really take these two pagan holidays and Christianize them. And really what they did in effect was they paganized Christianity. But they called it Christ's Mass on December the 25th. And so the question is, when did it really take place? Well, we get an idea of that from this passage in Luke 2. Because in this story, we see that the shepherds are in the fields at night taking care of their sheep. They're allowing their sheep to feed. And the reason they did that was because in a high desert climate, it was too hot to feed during the day. And so sometime between May to September is when the birth of Christ actually took place. Got it? Now here's the big thing to remember. It doesn't matter whether the birth of Christ happened on December 25th or some other day. What matters is that God became man and made his dwelling among us, and that event took place. Amen? Well, let's read this story together. If you have your Bibles, let's stand together, and let's read Luke chapter 2. We'll start in verse 8. It says, There were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared in the, with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told about them, about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Father, I pray this morning that as we take a peek into the lives of these shepherds, into this event, that you will speak to us. You'll speak to our relationship with you. You'll speak with our responsibility with this truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Father, bless this time and bless your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Please be seated. You know, let's not forget the context. God has not spoken in 400 years. Not a word to a prophet, not even a whisper to a follower. And the, these men, these shepherds, as they're out in their field at night, when the angel of the Lord showed up and when these, this angelic choir came, it, you can only, we can only begin to imagine how overwhelmed they were. They had reason to be terrified. They had reason to be in awe of what was happening. And so when I look at this text and I think about the story, I think about Mary and I think about Joseph and I think about Zacharias and Elizabeth and all that has happened in the Christmas story, I have to ask, why, God, did you choose the shepherds? Why did you make this first announcement to them? And, and I think there are three things that God wants us to see this morning from his word that help us to understand the importance of the shepherds in their story. The first thing I want you to note, though, is the idea of the good news. The good news is for everyone. He says, the angel said, I'll bring you good news of great joy. Well, what is this good news? The good news is that the Messiah has come. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. The good news is that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and no man can come to the Father except through him. The good news is that salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we can be saved. The good news is that Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, the only solution to the problem of sin that you and I have incurred. That's the good news. Now, I want you to imagine if you're God and you want to make this announcement that, you, that Jesus is being born. The most incredible, joyous news, literally, in all of human history, the Messiah is here. The Savior has been born. The one for whom Israel has been waiting. The one for who the world needs. Now, who are you going to make that announcement to? Who are you going to decide you're the first people who deserve or who need to hear this message? Who do you choose? I find it interesting that on that night when Jesus was being born, God chose a group of sheep herders, shepherds. Why did he choose them? You know, for us in our society, we would choose the political leaders. We would choose uh, uh, princes and kings to come to make this announcement. We would choose scholars and military leaders. We would call, we would call people theologians, people that could verify it. But God chose a group of ragtag shepherds. You ever think about that? God chose the last group of people that anyone would have ever thought about to share the news of the birth of Christ. 
He didn't choose the high and mighty society. He chose the lowly and the least. He chose a group of ordinary men who were not the social or the religious elites, but the outcast and the blue collar. God brought the message of hope, the message of salvation, the first group of people he talked to about this were a group of minimum wage workers. That gives you a little bit of context. Did you know that according to the Talmud, that these men, this group of people called shepherds, that they were considered as being heathen because their job kept them away from the religious festivals and the religious feasts because they were taking care of the very sheep that were feeding the people, that were clothing the people, and that were being used as sacrifices because they were taking care. They could not come to the temple to worship, and because of that, they were considered heathen outcasts. They literally were set aside as being insignificant. Think about that. When everyone else was making their trip to Jerusalem annually to make a sacrifice or to come to the feast and they needed that sacrifice, these guys were working and couldn't be there. Not only that, but because they were they were not just religious outcasts, because they were social outcasts, I mean they were dirty, they were stinky, they hung out with sheep. 24-7, 365. They probably didn't bathe once a month. They were looked down upon. They were seen as being suspicious. They were very much seen like gypsies or like the homeless are seen today in our culture. They were not very well recognized. In fact, if there was ever a question of, hey, something's missing, guess who got blamed? The shepherds. And this is the group of people. This is this little group of people that God said, let me bring you the best news in all of human history. Why? I think there's one reason. It's because God wanted to show that his love does not discriminate on the basis of status, on the basis of wealth, on the basis of social influence. It doesn't matter whether you live in Noonan, whether you live in Peachtree City, whether you live in Hollywood, whether you live in Timbuktu. It doesn't matter where you live. God doesn't value kings and priests more than than he values the blue collar worker. God doesn't distinguish between pastors and priests and missionaries versus people in the pews or people in the streets. What I think it teaches us is that Jesus is an equal opportunity savior and the good news is for all the world. It doesn't matter whether you're Muslim, it doesn't matter whether you're Hindu, it doesn't matter whether you're atheist, it doesn't matter whether you're a Baptist. It doesn't matter what your background is. The gospel, the good news is for everyone, for everyone who will believe. I like the way that Paul wrote about it in Ephesians. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Jesus is God's only means, his only means for the forgiveness of our sin. The gospel, the good news is for everyone. The second thing I want you to see is that the good news requires a faith response. It requires that we believe. Look what he says back in this text. He says, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds and said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened to us. Their response is so incredible. After hearing the message, after regaining their composure because they had just been blown away by these angels. After regaining their composure, they packed up everything and headed for Bethlehem. And this decision, this response altered their eternity. It altered the rest of their lives. See, that's what the gospel does. That's what the good news does. When we receive it, it changes our earthly life and it changes our eternal life. If your earthly life has not been changed by the good news, then I question whether or not you have ever received this good news. Paul said it this way. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things become new. All things. 
There's a new desire. There's a new passion. There's a new focus. There's a new hope because God is transforming your life from the inside out. Look what they did. See, they could have doubted. They could have said, you know what? Did this really happen? Did, we, did someone put something in our tea that we're drinking? Did we just hallucinate this? They could have doubted that what they had just experienced happened. And the truth is, there are people today that believe the gospel, the good news, that God so loved the world that he stepped into this world to become our Savior as the only means, the only mechanism for the solution of sin. There are people that believe that's too far-fetched. They doubt it. But they didn't. They could have debated it. They could have analyzed it. They could have said, well, you know, let's check all this. Let, let's look at all the information. Let's see if this all lines up. Let's see if this all makes sense. But that's not what they did. And yet it's amazing to me the people that live in our day and time, that despite the apologetics, despite the fact that there's more information about Jesus than there is about George Washington, people question his existence. People question his death, his burial, his resurrection. They want to debate it. They could have deferred it. They could have said, you know what? Let's just go to Bethlehem tomorrow. Let's go when it's convenient. Let's go when it's light and we can see where we're going. They could have, they could have said, you know, let's just, let's just wait. And yet it's staggering to me the number of people who will say, you know what? I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. And then when, right when I get to the end of life and I'm getting ready to step into eternity, that's when I'll say, okay, God, I want you. You can't defer Jesus. You don't determine the time that God gives you his invitation. You just determine whether or not you'll receive when he extends grace to you. The other thing they could have done, they could have denied it. They could have said, you know what, that did not just happen. And what's going on in Bethlehem, you know, it, it, there's no way this is really happening. The Messiah is not being born. They could have just flat out rejected it, just like people that you and I know who won't even take the time to look at the evidence when eternity hangs in the balance. It's staggering. What did the shepherds do? They chose the best way. They believed. They trusted the message and they pursued it with, tr with truth. They pursued truth. Listen to what it says. Let us go and see this thing the Lord has taught us about. They immediately knew when the angel showed up that it was God. They immediately knew that what he told them to do was worth checking out. They believed enough to move into, to, to, to take motion and go to this place called Bethlehem to see it for themselves. And it changed their eternity. And it changed their earth. Can I just tell you, it's not enough to hear about Jesus or to look into the manger and say, oh, how nice that is. The advent of God, God becoming flesh, was for one purpose. And that was to rescue you and me from condemnation. From the condemnation we deserve because of our sin. Because we're flawed because we're tainted with a cancer, a spiritual cancer that we have no ability of curing. And God came so that we would not experience eternal separation, so that we would not experience condemnation. And so Christmas isn't a time to get warm fuzzies. Christmas is a time to get serious about who God is and what he has done and why he has done it. He came to take those who were lost and make them found. He came to those who were condemned and incarcerated to give them emancipation, to give them freedom. See, if Jesus were born in Bethlehem a thousand times, but he's not born in your heart, then all this means nothing. You're, you will spend eternity separated from the God who loves you and desires a relationship with you. Think about that. He can be born a thousand times in Bethlehem, but if he's never born in your heart, 
then your life misses him. So no matter how, no matter how sentimental you get about Christmas, no matter how sentimental you get about this Christ child that was born on that holy night, if you and I do not receive this gift, then we miss the whole message and the whole meaning of Christmas. The very sole reason that God stepped out of heaven and into flesh was to rescue you, to rescue me from our sin. Jesus said it this way in Luke, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. He came for you, he came for me. And so this good news, it must be received by faith, just like it was with the shepherds. And then there's a third point, third thing I want you to see. And that is the good news must be shared with everyone. The good news must be shared with everyone. Look at this. He says, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been, done, what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Let me ask you a question. What do you do with good news? Your child gets engaged. I assume that's good news. Um, your child gets engaged. What do you do? You tell everybody. You get a new job. What do you do? You tell everybody. Your children do something spectacular. I don't know about you. I tell everybody because I'm proud. I'm excited. That's what you do with good news. You share it. You tell everyone. And that's what, that's what the shepherds did. They found this good news and they let everybody know what this good news was. Spiritually speaking, when a person comes to salvation, what do we do? We go into those baptism waters to testify, to share with everyone, I have received the gospel. That's what baptism's about. It's about sharing the good news of what's happened in you. And because the, these men, because their lives were trans, transformed by this baby in a manger, by God in the flesh, by God with us, they had to go and tell everyone that they knew, anyone that they came in contact with. They told their friends. They told their neighbors. They told their colleagues. They told their family. They told anyone who would listen. They would say, you need to know the Messiah has been born. And he's changed my life. We have to go and tell. We have to. Why? Because the good news is the greatest news that anyone can ever hear or receive. The good news that Jesus came to this earth, died on the cross to pay for our sins, it's the only news that can change a person's eternity. It's the only, th it's the only thing that can change a person's earthly life. It's good news. It kind of reminds me of the old concept, the old analogy. Many of you have probably heard about it. That if you found a cure for cancer, would you keep it to yourself? Of course not. You would make sure that it was accessible to everybody. Or if you're driving down the road and your neighbor's house is on fire, are you going to sit back and watch it burn and watch them die if you have the opportunity to save them? Of course not. You're going to do everything with your, within your ability to help rescue them. In the same way, when we come to the place that Jesus is more than just a baby in a manger, but he's the Savior in our hearts, we cannot keep that quiet. We have to tell someone else. We have to tell our friends. We have to tell our family. We have to tell our neighbors. We have to tell our colleagues. We have to tell anyone who will listen because this is, no, this is no ordinary event. This is the most significant event in human history that God would split time, that he would become flesh so that he could become your satisfactory sacrifice so that he could take upon his body your sin and my sin. And he could die on a cross 
to give us life. Not just eternal life, but a life with earthly purpose. And so as, with, as, 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 it, with, as is it is with the shepherds, anyone who, who's experienced the good news cannot help but to share the good news. Why did the shepherds come? Why did God come to the shepherds? Because every one of us in this room, everyone who's ever walked the face of this planet, needs the good news. What do they do with that news? They have a choice to make. They've got to decide whether they're going to believe it and receive it or reject it. And for those who receive it, God puts a special call upon your life to go and tell it. Why the shepherds? Because every one of us in this room, we're just like them. We're all in need of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the time we've spent this morning worshiping you. Thank you for the time this morning we've been able to come and just center around your word and to see that you loved us so much that you became flesh and made your dwelling among us. Lord, it boggles the mind that you would come to a virgin and say you're going to be the mother of God. It boggles the mind that you would come to a, a man wed to this woman and say, I've called you to be the earthly father of your heavenly father. And Lord, it even stirs our hearts to know that you would come to a group of men just like us Not the elite, but the common. And you'd reveal the message that you so loved each and every one of us. That you came to be flesh so that one day you could die to be our Savior. Lord, my prayer for everyone in this room is that we have truly settled that in our hearts that we don't just look into the manger and say, how sweet, how nice. But we look into the manger and we see the greatest love, the greatest gift, the greatest hope that can meet our greatest need. And we would receive by faith. We would say, I believe that this baby will be the one who dies to be my savior. And we'll accept this gift. Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never done that, if there's anyone here today that right now your spirit is speaking to them, communicating, convicting, inviting them to unwrap this gift of grace and this gift of love. I pray, Father, right where they are, that they would simply pray. And if that's you today, I just want to invite you to pray something like this. Say, God, I know you're speaking to me. And I really understand for the first time today that the reason Jesus came to this earth was to be my savior. And right now, the best I understand, I believe. And I would like to invite you to be my savior and Lord. Now help me to live this life called the Christian life in such a way that honors you. Not in my power, but in your power. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for coming for me. If you did that today, 
I want to ask you to do one of two things. Actually, I want you to ask you to do three things. One, either when we have our invitation, just a second, if you'll come down and allow us to meet you and pray for you. If, that, if that's something that you just feel like is too overwhelming, in the bulletin you came in, when you came in, if you'll just take that, put your name, put an email or, or an address, phone number, and then check that little box that says, today I invited Jesus to be my savior. And when you leave today, you can leave it in your seat or you can drop it in one of the brown boxes as you're exiting. It allows us a chance to pray for you, to communicate with you about this decision you've made today. There is a third thing I'd like for you to do though. And that is today, if you prayed and you said, you invited Christ to be your savior this morning. Will you tell someone today? It might be the person you came with. It might be your mom, your dad. It might be your, one of your children that you need to talk to. It might be a family member that you're visiting or, 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 or someone that you know, a friend. But tell them today, this morning, I believe that Jesus was not just a baby in a manger, but he is my Savior and Lord, and I invited him to my life to be my Savior today. Father, you know the hearts, you know what's going on in every one of us today. Lord, may we respond to you, whether it's to come to you in salvation, or Father, whether it's to return to you because we've drifted away. Father, may today be a day of hope, a day of healing, a day in which we get to honor you. Bless this invitation, Father, now in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand with me? And let me invite you to come. Our altars are open for you to come. You may want to come with your family and just kneel on the altars and pray together on this holiday season. It may be that you want to come and talk. Maybe God's calling you to be a part of this church family. Whatever decision that you have this morning, I invite you to come.